Christ alone. My hope is now. He is my life, my strength. So this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought of the storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, definitely an invaluable thing as far as um, getting more out of the sermon than you just would by attending church on Sunday. Um, getting other points of view on stuff, clearing up points, maybe things you missed, and just, you know, obviously growing in relationships with other people too is fantastic and growing in your relationship with the Lord as well. But um, just really uh, adding to what you get on Sunday. I would agree. Um, obviously, it's invaluable in rehashing the sermon and analyzing it and learning from it so that we can apply it to our lives. But we don't have family here. And so I think for us, a big part of the meaning of the group is that we have people we can turn to and rely on when life happens. And there's, I think there's, there's an accountability that comes from being in a small group to uh, uh, you know, read and discuss and learn all together. 
that accountability goes even further because we're so involved in each other's lives and we spend so much time together that we really do truly know each other. It's not you can walk into church for an hour on Sunday, put on the happy face, sit through an hour of worship and turn on and walk away and nobody really knows, you know, what you're facing, whether it's the joyous times or it's the trial times that here amongst our group, you know, we share that with each other and we know that. I think this particular group, because we are similar in a similar stage of life with similar aged kids, um, we're kind of going through a lot of the, the same parenting issues or, you know, marriage issues at the same time. And so I think that um, that support and just knowing that somebody's walking in your shoes um, or has before you um, definitely is helpful as far as, you know, the relational support and, you know, just venting about, you know, whatever. Um, you know, school, kids, um, whatever issues we're facing at the stage of life we're in right now. I think we've been together for some time now, so our friendship and relationships have grown. Um, like you said, Mary, we, I feel that we're more than friends, we're family. Um, we support each other whenever we're going through good times or difficult times. Um, we're there for each other, and I know we've said this, um, many times before, but we live life together. And I would agree, Julie, um, on the stages of life that we're in with our kids. I think that's really meaningful and important. You know, we're not meant to live in isolation, so we have each other to count on. And um, you know, when our kids are struggling or we're struggling, help each other out. And obviously, it's a little weird for me, you know, feeling like, is it a critique of the sermon or is it a, you know, just because of my position, but uh, I still get so much out of it um, personally because I'm able to step away from the preaching part and, and talk about how it applies to my life. What I said before we got on tonight was this is the night that I really wish we could sit around Nicole and Greg, your kitchen. <laughs> chat and hang out for the hour hour and 15 minutes before we could even get into anything you know we have your your mom's health issue and you know mary's trip home to her family and all these things that kind of would be great to catch up on which sitting around the table sharing snacks is a lot easier to do than than here on the zoom call but that's definitely one of the things that i i miss and you know used to really look forward to that time would share together.
morning, folks. I would ask you to join me in prayer for God's blessing over this time of hearing from his word. Uh, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us now to focus in on you. God, may these words be alive, may they be yours. And Lord, may we be able to apply them to our lives, that we would be obedient to you and grow more in our relationship with you. We pray these things in the mighty name, Jesus Christ. Amen. So as some of you might know, a couple of years ago, I helped a friend build a, a pool house for a housing plan out in Cranberry. It was an opportunity for me to see a building go from just a plot of land all the way through to the completed project. And I knew that in this, uh, there, there would be all kinds of different uh, sermon illustrations that would come out of it, as well as an opportunity for me to learn some new abilities. Now notice I did not call them skills, because I have a long way to go before I can move from being a hacker to something building, being a building skill. So the first day I was on site was the day after they had dug out the footers for the foundation. Um, here's a picture right here of what the site looked like the, uh, the day that I arrived. Doesn't look like a whole much, a whole lot of anything, right? Just a couple of ditches in the ground. Before you could get to this though, the completed project, we had to start with those footers. So getting that foundation correct was vital to the success of the entire job. And what I learned this day is that there are times where you want to do something that is right, but everything seems to be working against you. So, so the first thing I did when I was on this job site, you know, here I am, newly minted construction dude, is my job is to go over to these, uh, these footers, uh, these ditches basically, and start working on getting all of the water out of them that had filled them from when we had some rain. Now to put this into perspective, uh, the summer that I helped with this job was in 2018. Do you remember anything about the summer of 2018? That was the year that it felt like it never stopped raining here. We had flash floods in places where it rarely ever flooded. And I know it feels like a lifetime ago because of COVID, but <clears throat> it was only two and a half years ago that many of us, including here at Rolling Hills Church, we were dealing with all sorts of rain and flooding and mold. So I walk back to the one corner and I look into the ditch and I see a foot of water pooled inside of it. I start with a bucket. So I grab this bucket and I shove it down in there and it does a nice job of getting a lot of the water out. But then when the water level got too low, the, the, it was no longer flowing into the bucket, but there was still too much water in it. So I grab a shovel and I just start scooping, you know, not digging, but just trying to scoop the water out and then throwing it off to the side. But that's not doing a whole lot, it's taking forever. But I keep shoveling away, and it just seemed like every time, no matter how much water I, I took out of the ditch, it wasn't going anywhere. The water level wasn't going down. Because the ground was so saturated with water, it was draining into the ditch from the walls, even coming up from the ground, it seemed. So I'm scooping away for an hour, trying to get this water out so that we can begin laying block, and I, but I just could not get rid of the water. It was kind of like, like digging at the beach when you're a little too close to water, how the, the deeper you dig, the more water fills in the hole. So at this point, I'm becoming really frustrated because again, I'm trying to do a good job here and do things right but everything in that moment was working against me. And I'm sure that many of us can relate to an experience like this, correct? You could probably think of a time where you were trying to do some kind of, maybe some work in the yard or something around the house, and it just seemed like the further you were able to go, 
the more work it created. But what about when you're trying to live life in a way that honors God, and yet things seem to be against us the entire time? How many of you have ever felt that the more you try to walk with God, the more you try to live your life so that He is greater than you, one thing after another comes up, it gets in the way, and it drags you down again. Do you ever feel that your spiritual walk is one step forward and two steps back sometimes? So today, we're, we're in the book of Jonah. Uh, just to bring us up to speed here, Jonah, he is on the ship. The, the storm is raging outside. The sailors have confronted him about why the storm was even happening. And, and he has told them already that the storm was there because he was trying to run away from God and God's call to him to go to the people of Nineveh and preach against them. So the sailors, they, they've just asked Jonah what they should do to him in order to cause the storm to stop. And Jonah's response was, pick me up and throw me overboard into the sea. Now, Jonah has, dis uh, has shown, he's displayed that, that he did not want to do what God calls him to do. And he does not even want to do anything uh, himself to save these sailors. In essence, what he's telling these sailors is, if you want to save yourselves, then pick me up and throw me overboard, but don't think that I'm going to do anything myself to save you. Sounds like a swell guy, right? So we pick up this story in Jonah 1, verse 13. The words will be on the screen here, but I encourage you, go grab your Bible, hopefully you have it with you already, and follow along. Once again, Jonah 1, verse 13. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they couldn't because the sea was raging against them more and more. So let's get a little bit of context here before moving on to the application. We have read a couple of times now that this storm, it's getting bad, it's getting worse, and this verse allows us a little bit of a glimpse into how bad this storm must have been. In ancient times, the ships that were used for trade were not really meant to be the ones that would go out into the deep seas. Sometimes they're, they, uh, they, they would have to go out there when there was a storm because the water would be deeper there and that would hopefully help to keep the, uh, the, wet, the waves from uh, as high of a swell. But the other times, um, the only other time that the ships would go out to deep sea was that if they were trying to avoid uh, reefs or sandbars somewhere along the path there. Other times there may have been currents uh, which would have sped the ships along a route, but typically the ships were not that far off of coast. In case you're wondering, the highest wave that's ever been measured in the western Mediterranean Sea was 30 feet high. And guess what? It happened in 2020. Not really much of a shock, right? Uh, the worst thing that would happen would have happened in 2020. How original. Now, here's a map of the ancient trade routes uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. And you can, you can tell by looking at them how these routes, you see how they're clustered right around the shore. So it was rare to take a voyage across the deep waters of the sea. To put things into perspective, if you were to leave from Alexandria in, in Africa, there in Northern Africa, sail to Rhodes, which is just, just one of those little islands, you can see it marked on the map here with number three, uh, and then go from Rhodes to Rome, that would take you anywhere from 12 to 18 days, depending on the season in which you were making the journey. So knowing then that they likely stayed close to shore, it goes to show how bad the waves must have been that simply trying to move ashore was made impossible. Notice though that we have no indication whatsoever that Jonah was uh, working to help these sailors. He, 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 
There's no record of him working to get closer to shore so that they could drop him off of the boat safely. This guy had either totally given up or accepted that God was out to get him or something because time and time again, we see nothing of him trying to do something to help him safely get off the ship. Now, something that's lost on us because of uh, the, the translation from Hebrew to English is how the language itself points to how intense this storm was. A, a literal translation of the word used in English as road, the, the literal meaning of that word in Hebrew was that they were digging into the water. So you can just picture how intense this storm is. It's not, you know, these men were not rowing like it was this casual date with their spouse or anything. They are digging into this water, using all of their strength, all of their effort in order to get this ship to shore so that they could save their lives. They are literally rowing for their lives here. And you can begin to get a sense of how fruitless their efforts must have felt. They're trying to do the right thing, but it's just futile at this point. And that brings up an important thing to remember in life that we're going to get back to in a little bit. I have seen so many Christian leaders try to keep a ministry or a program afloat when it is apparent that it is time to let it sink. And so they put all of this time and all of this effort and all of this money uh, into it and they just keep fighting against it, rowing against it, digging into the water only for things to get worse. Folks, sometimes even when we are trying to do something that honors God, he might not want us to do it. And so he works against it. What I have found is sometimes rather than fighting against the enemy or this world's ways, we end up fighting against God's will in our lives. But a little more on that later. So here are these men, they're, they're, they're working to try to save the life of Jonah and they seem to be getting nowhere with their efforts. And that is what brings us then to our application for this verse today. The first thing we need to understand is that God's will for us does not come naturally. We will fight against his will. That is our nature, it is our sin nature. This also means that our desires must sometimes be sacrificed in order to have his desires for us in our lives. We see this clearly expressed in scripture, Isaiah 55, nine. God tells Isaiah that his ways are better, or they're higher than our ways. Now this probably shouldn't be that big of a surprise to us. We have seen Jonah's natural instincts kick in here already. God told him what he wanted Jonah to do, and Jonah went against all of it. But he certainly was not the only one to do so. Through the Bible, we see one count after another of people doing the exact opposite of what God wants for them. Adam and Eve and the fruit, Moses and the rock, the Israelites countless times, David, Solomon, even into the New Testament, there are times where we see the natural state of our shared human condition come back even to those who were literally walking with Jesus. We have this natural ability to do the opposite of how God would have us live and be. It's called our sin nature. We inherited it from Adam and Eve. And just to take a moment here to explain that a little bit further. First of all, I need to, to spend just a moment explaining where sin came from. See, a number of people, they've mistaken, they, they, they accept the, the wrong belief that sin was created by God and, or that it was even created by man. But man cannot create something out of nothing. It kind of, we'll get on that a little bit here. 
but God certainly did not create sin because we have a few verses in the Bible where we read that exact phrase. God cannot create sin. So we know if that's the case, then where did sin come from? Sin is the absence of God. It's not created. It's the absence of what was created. Sin is a void. Can, can you see that, that difference there? It wasn't created. It came into being when the opposite of God and his ways happened. And then added to this, we should ask what sin is. In a nutshell, sin seeks to answer three major questions of life apart from God. Think back to the Garden of Eden and the fall of, human, of, of humankind. As the serpent was tempting Adam and Eve to take of the fruit, there were three questions that were answered that they sought to answer apart from God. What is true was answered by asking, did God really say that? What is right was addressed by seeing that the fruit was pleasing to the eye, therefore showing that Adam and Eve's judgment of rightness was better than God's. God said, don't eat of this fruit, but Adam and Eve were like, well, we think it's right, so we're going to take it. And the third question, who am I, was answered by, by working towards being like God. Think of Satan's guidance. You will be like God. The thing is, we are not like God. So sin is the absence of God. It is the opposite of his ways. It's not this eternal force that is God's counterpart because there is no such thing as a counter to God. It is not this created force that people have tapped into. It is a void that is created when we do opposite God's ways. So now, if I can, I just want to put in a little plug for something that we're going to begin here at Rolling Hills Church. Starting February 19th and 20th, we're going to begin something called our Foundations Pathway. Uh, this is going to be something that all our people are asked to participate in because I think it will prove to be beneficial to you in helping to answer questions like this one and many more. So this Foundations Pathway, it's going to gather 12 times a year, once a month, and it will address different foundational beliefs and teachings of the Bible. Things like the doctrines of God, doctrine of the Bible, mankind, Christ, the Holy Spirit, salvation, the church, ordinances, kingdom of God, last things, evangelism, ministry, discipleship, and some others that will be addressed in this group. It's going to be interactive. It will be an opportunity to work through many of the questions you may have had, many that you have heard, or it's just going to be an opportunity that you never had the chance to ask these questions before. This is something that I'm really excited about because I know that it is going to be an encouragement to your soul and to your mind. So as I first spoke about this morning, uh, it will help guarantee that your spiritual foundation, going back to that idea of foundations here, your spiritual foundation is based upon something more than our individual ideas, thoughts, or cute little sayings that we read on the internet or social media. So again, there's going to be some more about this coming up in the weeks to come. But again, I would I, I encourage you, it's, this is going to be something that's in that, um, it's going to be expected of all of our, of our members, our ministry partners, that they would work through this because I guarantee there are, there are questions that will arise well, you're, you're going to have an opportunity then to enter into a dialogue to have better understanding of foundational truths of Scripture. So again, that date, February 19th, that's a Friday night for two and a half hours, and then February 20th in the morning for two and a half hours. 
Um, and the plan is for this to be in person. It'll be right here in the sanctuary. And I really hope and pray that all of you can, can plan to be a part of this. One final thing about this point of our very nature being that of rebellion and doing the opposite of what God wants us to do. I mentioned it earlier that we, uh, that we inherited the, that, that ability to, to, to sin. And some people, they might not like that idea. They, they might think, oh, you know, it's so unfair that because of the sins of Adam, we are all now cursed with the penalty of sin. Remember a couple of things though. Obviously, if Adam didn't sin, you certainly did. So it's kind of a, mute, uh, a moot point in that sense. But added to that, just as our penalty came from one person, it is also from one person that the blessing of forgiveness and grace has come. So if we say that it's unfair that Adam's sin has come down to us, then it is also unfair that Christ's sacrifice and reward has come down to us. Yes, Adam's sin is before us, and so are the, the, the plenty of sins we have done. But so is God's forgiveness, and it is found in the life and sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. So we can focus on, you know, it's so unfair that, that we have to deal with this penalty of sin, or we can focus on what a blessing it is that one man's sacrifice has taken care of my sin. And that's what I choose to focus on. We naturally fight against God's will and God's ways in our lives. And when we do so, God is willing to go to any length to bring us back and help us get to our best. In other words, God will use anything in our lives to work against us when we, are, when we are working against him because he knows that to be in his will, to walk in his ways, and to be in his presence is much better than going at life according to our desires. Again, we don't have to look any further than our example here today. Jonah, he is actively running from God, and God knows it would be better for Jonah to, 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 and certainly better for the people of Nineveh, for Jonah to walk in God's ways. And so God is willing to do anything. He, he will go to any length in order to bring Jonah back. Had Jonah gone on some overland caravan to escape going to Nineveh, then maybe God would have sent some other animal or some marauding raiders to bring Jonah to Nineveh. Had Jonah hopped on a plane, God would have been like, wow, that's impressive. We have a time traveler on our hands here. But God would have still been able to get to Jonah and guide him back into obedience. And again, this is something that we, that we see all through Scripture. God knew that the Israelites needed to be in Egypt for the upcoming famine. And so he worked with what the Israelites gave him, selling their brother Joseph into slavery in order to one day bring the entire family there so that they would be protected and blessed. God knew that it would be good for the Israelites to leave Egypt. And so since they were unwilling to leave, God used that unwillingness to bring them into slavery so that one day they could experience true freedom in him. God knew that it would be better for the Israelites to real, realize that they needed to look to him instead of their kings or rulers. And so he used their desire for a ruler to show them that they would become servants to their rulers rather than the other way around as it should be. Are you hearing that, politicians? This is not just about politicians, though. Follower of Christ, what are you giving him to work with? What are you forcing him to do because of the times that your sin nature comes roaring back into your life? 
I've seen this happen a number of times in my life. God knew that it would be bad for me to be a musician, and so he worked with what I was giving him uh, to make it so that I can't play any fun, aggressive music before my hands give out after a couple of minutes. God knew that it would be bad for me to be a teacher, and so he had me teach in an alternative education setting and realize how, how often it felt like my hands were tied when it came to helping students. God knew that it would be bad for me to be in sales for all my life. And please understand, what I am not saying is that it's bad to be a musician or a teacher or in sales. There are times where I wished I could be those things. What I'm telling you is that it would be bad for me because God placed a specific call on my life. He has worked in particular ways to prepare me for something different. Something different from the way he has worked in your life. So if you're called to be a musician, a teacher, a salesperson, stay-at-home mother, a office worker, professional, healthcare, first responder, whatever God has called you to, rejoice in that and be thankful that you did not settle for what you thought you wanted, but instead you were obedient to seeing the ways in which God was working in your life, using the things that you gave him in order to guide you into what he has for you. And if you're still journeying in that, please remember that there is a purpose to the process. God is not being mean to you. If you're still not sure, what am I supposed to do? When is this supposed to happen? God, give me some kind of clue on, on where you are leading me. There is that purpose in the process. He's not keeping you from the blessing of seeing your calling fulfilled because he doesn't have anything else to do. He is preparing you. It is purposeful. He is teaching you, revealing some things to you that he knows would be best for you to know and to experience and understand. I know that it's frustrating when we're wandering around the desert of delay it can be heartbreaking and maddening. So please remember that it is the preparation that makes the arrival so good and such a blessing. And remember that God is working through the things that we give him. And it will work out for his glory as long as we are obedient to it. I know the tendency is to assume that God has us wait or he has us struggle because he wants us to learn something new. But sometimes there is something more that needs to happen. And that takes us to our final point today. So our natural condition is to fight against God. He will use anything in our lives, uh, anything that, that we give him to help bring us back to him in his ways, which are ultimately best for us. And there must come a point of surrender to him then. We need to surrender. Now, some of you might think, all right, I can tune the pastor out for this part because I've already surrendered my, my life to Christ, but I'm not just talking about that. I read a quote recently that, that got me thinking, and it actually it kind of shook me to my core. This pastor, he said something to the effect of, we must be willing to admit that we are at war with God if we want to surrender. Again, we must be willing to admit that we are at war with God if we want to surrender. And when I read that, like I said, it, it hit me hard. How often do I assume that things are okay with me and God when in reality there is something amiss? There is something off, and it is not God, so I know it must be me. But I'm a pastor. I teach the Word of God. I read my Bible. I pray. Things must always be good for me spiritually, correct? I mean, we've just been talking about a guy in Jonah 
who received direct words from God concerning something that would happen in the future for a king, and it came true. Here is this guy in Jonah who, uh, who had God directly say to him, go to Nineveh, do this. Here is this guy in Jonah who is a prophet of Yahweh, the God of Israel. I mean, he's a prophet, he's a big deal. And yet we see that he is at war with God. Peter walked with Jesus. Surely he was not at war with God, except for when he denied him three times. Except for when it took God giving him this crazy dream about flying food in order for him to see that it's okay to speak with Gentiles and eat certain foods. And yet even still, uh, it took God using another leader in the church to call Peter out and show him that he was wrong for sitting with one group, these, these non-Jews. And then when the Jews came in, Peter was like, oh, I better, I can't be seen with them. I got to go sit over here. Paul had this crazy vision of Jesus Christ. God used Paul to bring the gospel to the world. I'm sure that he was never at war with God. You know, the same Paul who helped kill the first Christian. The same Paul who wanted to do a good thing by going to Rome or Spain, and God kept telling him no and working to keep him from going there until the time was right. Paul wanted to go, but God kept saying, no, now is not the time. And so Paul had to surrender to that. He had to recognize he was at war with God in that matter. We first have to admit that we are at war with God before we can surrender to him or else who are we surrendering to? Where in your life is God looking for you to surrender to him. In my life recently, it's been with my disappointments over this past year. As 2020 ended, I had to spend some time with God because I had this frustration of how things are. And it was beginning to bleed over into feelings of, you know, why bother? Or fine, I'll do it. Or let me force the issue here, God. All sorts of, of different thoughts depending on the moment. And through it all, God was using times like that to show me something that I had forgotten. It is better to trust in God that he will work through me no matter the situation, rather than try to create the situation where I think ministry will happen. I was at war with God once more, and it was over the issue of control. My thoughts were his. My ways were his. My dreams were his. My reactions were God's guidance. And I had to come to a point of surrender to him. That is what God wants of all of us, to surrender who we are and what we want to be and we surrender that to what he would have for us because we recognize that his ways are higher. They are better than our ways. So with Jonah, we will keep coming back to this. With Jonah, we see a lot of comparisons to our own lives and actions in, in this part of his story. Sailors who are strangers to him, working diligently to save him, when in reality, what needed to happen was for him to surrender to God's call to him. We might be reminded of our own lives, and we see that God's ways, uh, they're not natural for us to follow with. We will typically seek initially to run like Jonah did, because that's who we are. And so when we do that, God will bring anything. He will use anything that we give him in our lives, just like God used this uh, ship being at sea for Jonah. He will use anything in our lives to bring us to a point of surrender. Because in the big picture of life, we recognize that his way is better than our way. 
but we need to surrender to it. Will you please pray with me? God, I'm not sure how this message uh, will apply for, for everyone out there at different points in their lives. Lord, I'm not sure if the, the thing that, that they maybe need to recognize is that um, in their natural condition, in all of our natural states, Lord, we are in open rebellion against you. The God who created us, the God who loves, loves us, the God who um, gave us so much that sustains our lives. We rebel against you, Lord, and yet you still love us. So God, I pray that you would help us um, to recognize the times in which we are in rebellion to you. God, because we know that 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 time is coming where because it is better for us to be in that right relationship with you, being obedient to you, no matter how, how scary something might be that you are calling us to, we recognize that it is better for us to be there, and you obviously know this, and so you will use whatever we give you in our lives to bring us back to you. So God, I pray for, for everyone out there, for the things that are happening in their lives right now, whether it's financial issues or, or employment issues, um, relationship matters, health matters. God, whatever it is that they are facing, unease and, and, and no peace in their spirit right now, Lord, help them to recognize that it is there because you are using it to bring them closer to you, to bring them back to you. So God, help them to be obedient in hearing and seeing the way in which you are working in and through them. And Lord, help us all to daily surrender to you. Lord, to recognize the areas in our lives where we are at war with you, and properly surrender to you then. And I pray for anyone right now who has to surrender sin issues, who has to surrender relationships, fears, if they have to surrender their future, their worry, their pains, whatever they have to surrender right now, Lord, I pray that you would help them to do that. Give it over to you. Lord, and trust that you will do a miraculous work in their lives. And I pray for any who have not yet surrendered to you who are hearing this message right now. I pray, Lord, that as they hear this prayer, that they would be able to join in with it, pray it to themselves, pray it out loud if they feel comfortable with it, but that they would join me in prayer. God, surrender my life to you right now. I give you my life, my past, my present, my future. And I say, I ask, come into my life, Lord, as my Savior, my Redeemer, as my God, my Lord. God, I pray that you would forgive me of my sins. I pray that you would restore me um, to a right relationship with you. I pray that I would have your Holy Spirit residing within me, helping me every day to take another step, multiple steps closer to you and your will and your ways, because I recognize now that they are better than mine. So God, I surrender my life to you. I pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. If you prayed with us, uh, please take a moment, send us an email. Um, the email address is right there at the bottom. 
uh, contact us uh, through a comment on Facebook, on YouTube. Get a hold of us and let us know that, that you prayed and, and how we can continue to be in prayer for you. Uh, we, we, we look for opportunities in which we can connect with you and uh, we, we want to be able to rejoice with you in whatever your prayers may be. Um, know that we are here standing with you, praying uh, for you and with you as well. I want to thank you again for taking the time uh, to join us uh, this morning. As always, we are in person um, Sundays at 10 o'clock a.m. So uh, we would love to, to make your acquaintance if you've uh, just kind of been visiting. Uh, if you're a part of the church that we haven't seen for a while because of COVID and you're at a point now where you can start coming back, we, we welcome you back. We can't wait to see you here uh, because we miss you. And a number of people have come back, but I know that it's going to take some time before we're all back here and, uh, and we can see uh, the new faces that God is adding to his kingdom. So uh, we hope to see you soon. Um, Jimmy's going to come up here with a couple of announcements. And then after that, Jay is going to close out our time with some worship. Um, thanks again for joining us. Pray that you would have a blessed week. Rolling Hills family, good morning, everybody. So glad you guys are with us again this morning. Um, I pray you guys are having a great day. I pray you guys are in a great place. I pray God um, spoke to you through the message, and I pray um, that he reveals to us and shows us what he wants us to see this week um, through it, how he wants us to grow in him um, and get closer to him like he always wants us to. Amen. Uh, we got a couple announcements today. I got my notes in front of me. I'm going to cheat so I don't forget to tell you guys anything. Um, first is the youth. Again, we're going to meet on Thursday from 6 to 8. That is going to be the Zoom call. Um, I will always plug that. I encourage it because it is just great conversation with these kids and they ask more questions. Um, you know, a lot of them have to look up and, and their their minds are just they're going, which is just great. It is great convo about what's going on and convo about God, about what is uh, going on with him in this world and everything. So um, encourage that every Thursday from 6 to 8. Reach out to us if you need the link. Um, our community groups, community group, excuse me, they are meeting on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Saturday. And we are looking for um, a couple other groups. Um, so we're looking for people that would mind, uh, wouldn't mind hosting one, or if you um, are not comfortable with that, if you want to join one of ours, we just, um, we want to get these out there. We want to show you guys how important these are. Again, they are, you know, your church in a church, I like to say. This is where we're getting our fellowship that we're kind of not getting as much as we can, um, you know, during the COVID season. But even without that, these are the, the, the families that you're, um, you know, the friends and family that you're growing inside of your church. So um, I truly encourage it. Ours has been has been great. So please reach out to us if you would like to be a part of one or you'd like to even start one. Um, let me or Pastor know about that and we will reach out um, or get you guys the information on that. The giving statements are now available. If you do not receive yours either in the mail or by email, um, please contact the church and we will get that information out. So just let us know if you haven't um, received yours or not. And this one's a little longer, so I'm going to make sure I, I read it to get all the information, but pastor spoke about the foundations pathway. Um, first one is February 19th and the 20th. On the Friday the 19th, we will meet from seven to 9.30. And then on Saturday the 20th, we will meet from nine to 12.30 PM. Due to COVID, we cannot offer childcare, but we will begin doing so once we can safely reopen things. We will meet in the sanctuary of the main church building. Social distancing and masks are still expected, but do not let that keep you um, from being a part of this a big help that will truly uh, grow your, your spiritual walk. Uh, the first foundation will take place, we will take a look at uh, is the doctrine of God. We are going to ask some questions on the difficult questions of God. Is there really one and only God and one way to heaven? If God is so good, then why is there suffering in the world? And what in the world is the Trinity? So stay tuned for more info on that. Um, I'm really excited about these. This is, you know, the questions you... Uh, want to ask the things you want to talk about the stuff you probably heard you probably thought about and you think you know um, but it'll be great to kind of get the detail and why do we believe this and where God talks about it in the scripture so I'm very excited for that so that again is February 19th and 20th yeah so stay tuned for information on that but again any questions please reach out to us www.experiencegodsgrace.org and we will get that to you awesome 
great. Uh, again, enjoy you guys worshiping with us, and I pray you guys have a great week. God bless you guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm.